Hello and welcome in to Fantasy Baseball today on Thursday, November 9th, my birthday. I am Frank Stanfield, joined by Scott White. And wow, way to spring that on. Whoa. Us. Happy birthday to Frank. Take yeah. it, Scott. Happy I think there are copyright issues with that song. Oh. I, I'm not that good. Happy birthday, man. Thanks. Thanks, buddy. That is Chris V. Welsh today on the show. I have a bunch of observations from the players I saw out in the Arizona Fall League. It's a Frank's scouting notebook, if I <laughs> say so myself. Uh, Welsh and I interviewed Ray's shortstop prospect Carson Williams, and the Angels have hired a new manager. I mentioned yesterday I had a great time out in Arizona. Welsh took me under his wing, so to speak. We heard, uh, we saw and heard a bunch of interesting things, but perhaps nothing crazier than a foul pop-up that went about a mile in the air came down and landed directly on a fan's head. It was so loud. I thought it hit the cement. That was the sound that it made. Let me see oh, if I can recreate it. Let me see if I can recreate it. Some dude's head. So check us out. Like it sounded, oh. that was actually pretty good. If you remember, Frank, yeah, let me once again, this is uh, like uh, ADR, like movie yeah. stuff. Like that's how it sounded. It was so scary. Like, And by the way, it was only one of two people that got hit directly in the skull that day. A player in the dugout got hit. A raised pitcher got right. bonked right in the head. But this guy, it was Frank's right, mile high, didn't touch anything, didn't bounce off a wall, had no momentum taken away from it, and just went directly on this person's skull. And it made that sound. And we were all just eyes open like, oh, my God. I don't know what was in the air while we were out there, but between that, I think the night before we saw like an elderly man kind of fall down while trying to catch a ball and uh, Kevin Alcantara like launched his bat into the the net. It was, it was crazy. Yeah. Stuff. The was, person almost got hit. The guy stepped carnage, on the foul ball. Right. Yeah. This old man, a foul ball. He was chasing after the foul ball and then he stepped on the ball and fell into baseball HQ's Chris blessing and like hurt him. And then Kevin Alcantara, I, uh, me and Chris Clegg were doing an interview in the stands of Peoria and a ball whizzed by both of our AFL was trying to tell us a story and that it missed Scott White. If Scott White was there, yeah. none That's of this carnage would have happened. Sounds like you guys were lucky to make it out alive. We I don't were. Know. This is not a lucky to see your birthday, Frank. You're lucky to see your birthday. Yeah, yeah, I am. Scott, you ever catch a foul ball or any type of ball at a game? Because I never have. No. Welsh? I have actually. Uh, when I, okay, so quickly, in Mesa, where we were years ago, uh, me and my son are sitting in the very front row doing filming. Ball goes back; it bangs right off of the glass, comes flying down right to us, and I one hand it, and the crowd cheers for me. Amazing wow. moment! And I'm with my son, and he's like seven or eight. So then, about uh, five minutes later, we get up because he's got to, you know, have popcorn or something. And we walk up. And this person goes, great catch, grabs me, you know, high, you know, high five. This person, that was an awesome catch. Get up to the top. The guy was like, that was a great catch. I'm like, thank you so much. We get up. My son looks at me. He's like, man, that was a great catch. I'm so proud of you, dad. And I was like, greatest moment of my life. That's why baseball is amazing. That's why baseball is incredible that all these people completely uh, just created this moment for my kid. But that was a great one. And I almost had a second one, which then Frank could have said he was so proud of me but he didn't get to say he was proud of me because I was trying to catch a ball with my hat and it uh, binged right off my hat. Oh yeah. At that the was, home run derby. That was so the home run derby. <laughs> overcome with pride that he actually said, I'm proud of you, dad. That's oh, like all these people. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's like the greatest dad moment all the time. Cause it was like three people were like, that was great. That was great. And they had cheered beforehand. And it was like, we got to the top of the steps and I was like, all right, buddy, what do you want? And he was like, man, that was a great catch. I'm so proud of you. And I was like, I'm proud of you too, man. It's great. <laughs> Let's watch the games, get some popcorn. The, cl the closest I've come to uh, catching a baseball, it's probably the complete opposite of the story you just gave us. Did you steal it from a kid? No, I was no. at City Field and Starling Marte literally pointed at me. I was sitting in the front row of the outfield. He threw the ball at me. I had my phone in my hand. I completely fumbled it. Some kid ran down and stole the ball while it was on the ground. But that's what I get for having my phone in my hand and not paying attention. And and yeah, that, that was the closest I've ever and gotten. How old were you? Uh, that was this year, Scott. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it's, 
it's probably better that the kid got it then, right? Yeah, I mean, I probably would have given it to a kid anyway, but like, yeah, I, I uh, never I caught a ball at a game and whatever. <laughs> I'm, I'm mad at myself. Let's talk about the Arizona Fall League, some observations. I'm going to go in chronological order of when I saw these prospects play. So I had just a running notepad on my phone and I'm there just typing away and taking notes. And the first one was Victor Scott, who is a prospect in the Cardinals organization. Every time he was on base, and I saw him the first game was on Thursday night. He was trying to steal a base and he did so successfully on Thursday. I saw him in the fall stars game. He reached base three times. Guess how many steals he had. That's right. He had three steals in that game this season in the minors. He had 94 stolen bases. He hit 303 with nine home runs. He did that across 132 games. Got 66 of those games in at double a. Well, somebody asked me this on Twitter and I wanted to get your thoughts. I'm not sure how familiar you are with like Esteri Ruiz's development and where he was at this stage in his career. Sure. But someone basically asked, like, will Victor Scott turn out to be a better hitter than Esteri Ruiz? And to that, you will say, yeah, that, I mean, that's well, that's been like the common comparison because of the sheer amount of stolen bases. So I actually got to see Esteri Ruiz from his earliest development when he was in the rookie league because he was a royal. And I actually watched him as a royal get traded to the Padres and then play for the Padres on the complex side, which was a really interesting thing. And, you know, when he was in the complex, he just destroyed just the bad pitching, you know, big fastballs, lots of doubles power actually had kind of a projectable body. And then the batting average just sank and sank and his decision-making was sinking and sinking. So the reason that we make, it's like the cheap comparison is because Victor Scott steals all the bases in the world. As a matter of fact, I interviewed him and it's on my prospect one show uh, that dropped today. He actually had the lead in stolen bases when the minor league season ended. And about 10 days later, they took it away from him. I didn't even realize that. And I was talking and he's like, they actually took it away from me. Cause I said, you had the lead and he didn't even know why um, I was with uh, Eno and we were both like, we we're all three of us were sitting here. Like maybe it was a, in a defensive indifference or something, but he had the lead over Chandler Simpson and uh, you know, Chandler Simpson with the Rays is kind of a zero power guy, which was was what I think people assumed Estory Ruiz it was. But Estory always had doubles power, and he's just made better decisions, and he's been able to kind of tap into that. Like, I think he's maxed out his hit tool. The difference with Victor Scott, and something he had said to me was, the Cardinals early on, they gave him homework on what to do. And a lot of prospects don't get this in systems. I've talked to, I've cited this, but like Curtis Mead, I talked to him two years ago, and after his breakout and the Rays had told him nothing. I was like, man, what a great season. You know, what, what were the Rays doing and working on you with? He's like, nothing at all. So a lot of guys don't get that. Victor did. And what Victor said was they, they told him like where they want him to hit and the blast charts and all that type of stuff. And they said, do it. So now he said, it's on, he said, his quote was, it's on me to implement this in games. And we've seen that he had nine homers in the regular season. He's hit three more here. You can see there is a, a, um, a loft approach to his swing. It's not a full ground ball approach. He get, kind of similar to what James Triantos told you and I, Frank, that I think Victor gets in front of the, uh, in front of pitches just like a little bit early, which is a, enabling him to barrel. And he's tapping into some of that power. I think as Chris Clegg had said, Victor Scott can absolutely be a better version or what we really want from Estory Ruiz. I think he can hit for better average. I think there's more power in there. I think he's as dynamic of a stolen base guy. And we talked a lot about his stolen bases and the work he has put into it. Cause I literally was trying to be like, Hey, what's, is it speed or is it reading the pitcher? And he went into this incredible breakdown of how he's approached stealing bases. I think he is a super introspective player that really understands himself working super hard to get better. And you're seeing that play out here. And like you said, he hits the ball every single day. So you don't want to go nuts about it, but this is a major speed guy with fantasy relevant power and a really good hit tool. Victor Scott, like he's a, he's an easy top 100 prospect to bet on. And maybe the Cardinals make some moves for some room for him, or it might just take a little bit longer than we'll probably be comfortable with, but I'm betting on Victor Scott. Yeah, that's where I was going next. And I was going to ask you, Scott, I'm not sure that we'll see Victor Scott this season coming up in 2024. I mean, again, he did get some games in at double a, there's a possibility, but the Cardinals just from a playing time perspective, they kind of have this log jam right now with all these outfielders. So uh, I'm not sure that they really need to rush Victor Scott at this point. Yeah, 
yeah, I'm still, I'm pretty skeptical of this profile in general. Um, where it's, you know, we see the 94 steals from Victor Scott, and it's such an eye-popping number, especially because stolen bases are always in such high demand in fantasy, but they're really not that valuable in real life. And certainly over the past couple decades, we've seen teams approach base stealers as if they're not that valuable. Um, you, you know, you think back to past prospects who had tons of speed and not much else. Um, like Billy Hamilton, you, Billy Hamilton, but more recently, draw Dyson. More, more recently, like Vidal Brujan, we we thought he was going to be a big deal in fantasy, and he fizzled out pretty quickly. Uh, even Estuary Ruiz, he, he ended up with a ton of stolen bases, but even on a terrible athletics team, they, they kind of got tired of <laughs> the low OBP without much power in their lineup. I know, look, I, I got Victor Scott's stats pulled up. He's walked a lot in the Arizona Fall League. He does have the three home runs. Only a 417 slugging percentage, I'll point out, in Arizona. 425 slugging percentage in the minors this year. Uh, Estuary Ruiz, frankly, delivered more power in the minors than we've seen from Victor Scott so far. Um, you know, I, I have been pretty open-minded to Sal Freelich being a, a, a strong fantasy option. And he doesn't have much power. You know, he's definitely speed over power. But he has, like you know, a plus contact skills, same with like a Steven Kwan. So they, they do have another tool in there beyond just the speed that I think uh, makes it more likely they stick as everyday players in the majors. I'm not saying Victor Scott won't be a major leaguer at some point. I'm just, I'm skeptical he'll play enough for us to care about him in fantasy. And I, I don't know that he's going to be in my top 100 prospects for this upcoming season. Let's move over to one of the other big names that's out here. Uh, that was out in Arizona that I saw. Guardians prospect Chase DeLauder, who was probably the most poised hitter I saw out there. Uh, game on Friday afternoon, which was just loaded with talent. DeLauder was there. Kyle Manzardo, Kevin Alcantara, James Trianto. So a lot of names in that game. But DeLauder is one that stood out. Obviously a great feel for the strike zone. He went one for three with a double in that game. He also had two walks out in the AFL. He's got five homers, five steals. More walks than strikeouts, 14 to 11. He's got an 899 OPS. Uh, he is 22 years old. He got up to six games in double A. Scott, I'll come right back to you here on uh, Chase the Lauder. Do you think there's a chance that we will see him in 2024? Well, I mean, the lack of reps hurts his chances. He's a talented player. I did have him in my top 100 prospects this past season. And because of the foot injury, right? That's what he missed most of the season with a fractured foot. Uh, he ended up playing only 57 games. Um, so that puts him behind a little bit. And I know somebody like George Valera, who I, I didn't have such a great year this past year for the Guardians, but he's been regarded among their top prospects for a long time. And he's further up the organizational ladder. So I would imagine he would get a shot ahead of somebody like Chase DeLauder. But the Guardians, you know, they've had trouble out filling out their outfield for years now. And um, ultimately, it's going to come down to performance. If 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 DeLauder is able to use this strong AFL performance as like a springboard into next year and, and really hit the ground running at double A, move up to triple A quickly, I mean... You know, it's, it's going to come down to performance in the end. I think he's talented enough to make it happen. And I think that the guardians have enough needs offensively to make it happen, but whether it happens, I mean, I think it's going to depend on the player. Uh, Welsh long-term. What are you thinking here with uh chase DeLauder? Because just in my mind, I'm not sure that he turns into like maybe a stud fantasy player, but I think someone that hits for solid batting average gets on base. Maybe he's like a 15 to 20 Homer, 15 to 20 steal. Maybe I'm just selling him short too. Uh, but, what do you think about what you've seen from Chase Lauder and maybe his long-term upside? Yeah, I mean, I've said that I think he might be the he might come out of this as like the best major league player at the end of the day. Physically, the most talented. Uh, he had the best presence inside the zone. I mean, you just don't fool him. I think he had 11 total strikeouts out here. He's walking more than he's striking out. That's kind of a constant with him. His decision making is elite. It reminds me of like how um, it's not quite how Vlad was uh, Vlad Jr. when he was out here in the AFL. Like 
the bat, like Vlad was only swinging in the zone. Like he was swinging at his pitch. It was a very advanced approach. And the has got kind of that, again, they're not the similarities in that, but like the same visual approach to the zone. And he attacks it with just pure raw power with a swing that not everybody likes. And I think there's a decent chance from a fantasy perspective, the could be more valuable than Kyle Manzardo when it's all said and done, because you're looking at a 2020 guy that I think is primed to be a number three hitter for a team with the decisions he makes, the contact he makes, he leads the AFL and RBI. And he has done that. He's pretty much held it the entire year that he's out here. So um, I think there's a decent chance. He is a five tool contributor and maybe Manzardo is going to be a little bit more elite power might struggle with batting average. We'll see, but I think the lotter could be the better fantasy option. So I'm a big buyer on the lotter. I think Manzardo contributes way more this year. I completely agree. Valera is the top guy first, but we will. I do believe we will see Delauder in 2024 in some capacity with the Guardians. And long term, I would I would bet on him. He's a guy I want to buy well, right just, now. Just I mean, he brings an element of speed that Mazzardo is completely lacking. Five yeah. steals in 21 AFL games. So, you know, just from that perspective, and and I do like the plate discipline a lot for Delauder. That's something he and Mazzardo have in common. All right, in that same game on Friday afternoon, I mentioned this name already. Kevin Alcantara, he is a Cubs prospect, big dude. We're talking six foot six. Uh, I think there's a lot of power here. We saw it a loud triple to left field that he hit, just barely missed a home run. And then later on in the game, he had an impressive inside out swing. He went to right field, which scored two runs. Um, but on the opposite end of the spectrum, pretty much completely, we have Caleb Durbin, who is his teammate. And well, so you kind of made this comparison and, and asked James Triantos about this because they all play on the same team together. Caleb Durbin is a prospect in the Yankees organization. He's kind of like a utility guy, second, third base, shortstop. He's five foot six. So he's literally a foot shorter than Kevin Alcantara, a spark plug. He had three steals in that game that we saw. He's up to 21 steals total out in the Arizona Fall League. He's batting 358. He has double the amount of walks, uh, double the amount of strikeouts. What am I saying here? 14 walks to seven strikeouts. That's what I would like to say about uh, Caleb Durbin. So polar opposites, Welsh. Uh, but what are your thoughts here on Alcantara and Durbin? Yeah, so I mean, on Durbin, I've been like just kind of going off about it for the last week. Maybe I'm just going to be so wrong because AFL does this to a lot of people. You know, there's a couple of those guys like CJ Alexander is a 26-year-old big power hitter with the Royals. Uh, Blaze Alexander's his brother. He's hitting here. Oliver Dunn with the Phillies. He's a... 26 year old middle infielder that's dominate. He's doing some stuff. There's just something about Durbin though. There is something in that, like that Altuve mold where he's a, you saw him five foot six, but he's a thicker build of a five foot six guy. He's constantly barreling. Same thing. I would come back to Triantos. The bat is in the zone at all times. If that ball is anywhere in the strike zone, he's got doubles power. He showed actual power. He's got double digit, um, uh, extra base hits out here in the AFL. He was hitting three and he has three stolen bases shy on Thursday of the AFL record. And he wants it. They're playing him and they put him in a really prime spot hitting behind Alcantara and them. Listen, he's not a top 100 guy, but I think he's a great bet in deeper leagues right now. He's also only two years into his minor league career. He was traded, I believe this year from the Braves. He was with uh, Scott's team in the Braves mm -hmm. in 2021 and he is a total gamer beloved by his team and spark plug is the word. He just might be one of those guys that finds his way into a major league roster because the bat is live. And, you know, Kevin Alcantara might be the most tooled player out here. Uh, there are some stuff. I, I still think the swing and miss is pretty prevalent. Uh, I do think he, I don't want to do the lazy, like, you know, Ellie and Onyo because it's like a tall, lengthy big power speed guy, but there are like vibes of that. I just, I wonder if he's going to have less plate presence than maybe O'Neill Cruz, but I think he could hit better than Ellie De La Cruz. Um, I just don't think he's going to be as aggressive on the base pass. So all of this is to say like Kevin O'Contra is a mold of a prospect you want to bet on. And I would still bet on him. Caleb Durbin is like everything you don't want in a prospect, but he's right. just defying the odds. And I kind of want to, I want both of these guys, but Caleb Durbin, I, I want to get cheap wherever I can. And he will be cheap because nobody, nobody has him. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah. I, 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 I think your breakdown of, of uh, Durbin there is fine. Um <laughs> I, I guess, you know, I, I just want to 
it, and and like, look, Caleb Durbin's not a big name prospect. This is probably the first time a lot of the audience is hearing of him. You said yourself, he's not a top 100 guy. So I, I think we covered all the hundred guy in most in most yeah, months. I, I don't, right. I don't see him ranked in the top 30 of the Yankees on MLB pipeline no. either. So. Well, and that and that can like when you get when you get that deep in an organization's prospect rankings, it's very malleable. So like maybe a big AFL performance is enough to move Caleb Durbin into the top 30 or even the top 20 in the Yankees farm system. Um, but I mean, the more likely scenario is he's a utility guy, like a, a miles master Boney, a Garrett Hampson, uh, type player there. Like, I like that. There's, I like that. There's good on base skills that, you know, if you're, if you're not going to lit, if you're not going to be a power hitter, but you can get on base, there's a chance. I mean, Steven Kwan was nobody's idea of a big name prospect. And now, you know, he was a, uh, a top rookie two years ago and um, is a mainstay in fantasy now. So it can certainly happen. And if you're in a deep dynasty league and want to take a flyer on a guy, nobody's really heard of. I think Caleb Durbin is a good example of that. Uh, but, you know, I just want to, I just want to keep it real and say it's unlikely he develops into anything worthwhile in fantasy. Yeah, five foot. I mean, you don't bet on five foot six uh, baseball players a whole bunch, and he's an absolute unknown. And I completely agree. And this is speaking to the guys that the Scott Whites of the world that have twenty fourteen leagues yeah. with ten. <laughs> Those are all my league leagues. spots. That's what I'm saying. Like <laughs> that's the spot where I think he becomes really interesting, and he's shined a light where I think there's going to be a lot more attention. And when you get into the world of a team that's like, hey. You know, we're just looking for some depth. I think he's a depth guy. It's going to take a while. But when you're out here, you know, I'm not a I don't claim to be and I'm not trying to be a scout. I'm just, you know, it's it's my own version of evaluation. When you see guys day in and day out and you constantly see the same things, you see guys that are the best hitter or second best hitter on that team after Triantos and barrel the ball and do show power and aggressive on the base paths and uh, are clutch. I mean, those are, those are things that Caleb Durbin does, which it's like, Oh, we're now in this space where he was nothing for anybody to, I don't know, like just keep it in the back of your mind for the, the, the future. Cause there might be something there, but sure. There's probably 30 AFL guys here, 30 prospects in the AFL that you would want to put more of your focus on. And it's not, he's, he's not in play for like top 250. And again, that yeah. is Caleb Durbin prospect with the New York Yankees. Let's take our first break. When we return, I've got some news and notes. We'll talk about that managerial hiring. We'll do that here on fantasy baseball today. Two legends. One last curtain call. Can Rapino lead the reign to a long awaited title? Or will Allie Krieger and Gotham pull off a true Cinderella story? It's one final chance to earn some hardware. The NWSL Championship on CBS and streaming live on Paramount Plus. The news and notes. We'll start off with a bunch of Dodgers news, apparently. Maybe it's not really news at all, but Mookie Betts will play a lot of second base in 2024. He made 62 starts at second base this past season, and Dodgers GM Brandon Gomes also mentioned that Miguel Vargas and Michael Bush might have to transition to corner outfield in order to carve out significant playing time. So I thought that was somewhat interesting for them. Sticking with the Dodgers, they're still discussing whether Walker Buehler will have an innings limit in 2024 as he's coming back from Tommy John surgery and uh, one other Dodgers item. Gavin Lux appears on track to be the team's starting shortstop next season. Uh, last we saw Lux was in 2022. He hit 276 mm -hmm. with six homers, seven steals, a 745 OPS and 129 games. He turns 26 later this month. Scott, is there is anything? That... What's up? Well, when you say he appears on track, is that, is, is that somebody like us looking at the depth chart and saying, Oh, Gavin Lux lines up to fill that shortstop opening, or was that coming from like Dave Roberts or Andrew Friedman or somebody like that? I I think it was just part of this press conference from their GM Brandon Gomes, where he kind of okay. hit all these different so, news items. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's you know that that has some real weight behind it then, and I think that's uh, I I wasn't sure they entrusted him defensively to to handle shortstop, but if that's the case, I need to move Gavin Lux up in my very early rankings a bit. You know, not not that he needs to be drafted everywhere because he hasn't shown a ton of potential offensively. The power's been less than we hoped it would be when he was first coming up. But a regular in the Dodgers lineup at a position that thins out pretty quickly, I think. I think that's uh, 
certainly going to put Gavin Lux on the radar in 15 team leagues, if not 12 team roto leagues. I think they also mentioned Miguel Vargas. They, they reiterated the wrist injury, holding him back and being part of the struggles. Just pointing that out that I think that was a part of this conversation when they spoke about Miguel Vargas. So I know he'll be a big topic and he's a, you know, he he's kind of out of everybody's mind, but it'll be interesting to see where that goes and yeah. what this, you know, recovered version of Miguel Vargas looks like in spring training. I still wish I could look at exit velocity data for him from 2022 that we had that available because it was, it was unimpressive both in the majors and at AAA this year, the, the numbers at AAA, once he got sent down were, were fine. They were what we were used to seeing from Miguel Vargas in the minors, but uh, the exit velocities were still pretty, pretty bad and i wonder how much the wrist impacted that specifically bryce harper will strictly play first base moving forward with the phillies meaning that reese hoskins will more than likely not be back in philadelphia cubs president of baseball operations jed hoyer said that christopher morell will play first base in winter ball morell has never appeared at first base at any level minors or majors in 107 games last season <laughs> morell hit 247 with 26 homers, six steals, and 821 OPS. The guy has tools for days, there's no doubt. 95th percentile barrel rate, 81st percentile sprint speed for Morrell, but a 31% strikeout rate. Uh, well, it's just it's pretty interesting because, I mean, if we can get a guy at first base who can steal, who can go like 30-10 or 30-15, that's a pretty unique skill set. Uh, another thing that immediately comes to mind, too, is, boy, this team hates Matt Mervis. They're like, we would rather put Chris Morell at first base than even talk to you guys about Matt Mervis doing anything. So I feel like that, I don't mean to make it about him, but it like showers more of that just negativity. And, you know, if that's one more reason why they may bring somebody in and they did it three times over last year, they bring somebody in to compete and you also have Chris Morell in there. What writing really seems like it's starting to be on the wall for Matt Mervis and what this team thinks about him. I would not be shocked if we saw Mervis get moved during the winter meetings that are coming up here, because if you're talking about Morrell doing this and clearly this team is here to spend after signing council, I, I would have to say he's going to be probably, I wouldn't be shocked if he's like an A, <laughs> you know, it's just like, Send him to the A's. That's the team that could get him out at first base. Like, I feel like it's going to be a team that wants a little competition at first base, and it feels like the Cubs just don't want him there. So sorry I made it about Matt Mervis, but that's what's no. so telling uh, when I think about this. Every show the two of us do together about Matt Mervis. So, <laughs> so what you're saying is I should not keep Matt Mervis in the nope. Scott White dynasty. Well, nope. but what if, what if Matt Mervis is a brewer? <laughs> what if Matt Mer Mervis is out there, uh, you know, they get rid of Rowdy yeah. and he's a brewer? Well, I mean, obviously monitor what happens this off season, but I, no, I, ha I have a sinking feeling about Mervis. Not so much because, I, not so much because I doubt the talent, though I do think there are reasons to question it. Uh, but j just because of the way the Cubs have approached him and continue to approach him, and it's very different than what we were hearing as he was breaking out two years ago, when they were saying internally they're comparing him to Anthony Rizzo. They must have. Uh, really cooled on him it's a stark stark turn and also look at a guy like how J i mean how james triantos has played and maybe putting him in a corner infield spot he's played third base but i legit think if this team was like all right matt mervis or kyle Hendricks, they'd be like well kyle get up that first base glove because they <laughs> whatever they can do to not have matt mervis have an opportunity yeah. is clearly where they're headed Blue Jays GM Ross Atkins said that Alec Manoa has quote earned the right to have a strong leg up for an opening day rotation spot next season I think I looked into his early ADP and it was something like 380. So, I mean, Alec Manoa is free, rightfully so, but yeah, so kind of like in a Jose Barrios way, we have no reason to bank on Alec Manoa, you know, bouncing back outside of the fact that he was really good the two years prior. So, I don't know. If he's free, I, I might be in on Alec Manoa. I mean, it's the definition of a lottery ticket. You yeah. know, you, you pay next to nothing for a chance at something huge, knowing that it's probably just going to be trash at the end. I'm what are you calling it trash? Cause that's what a lottery ticket that doesn't pan out is. It just goes in the trash can, right? Do you um, have that up? Do you have the NFBC stuff up? Yeah, he's uh, there's 19 drafts. 370.8 is the ADP. Could you do what are uh, like uh, Ricky Tiedemann or Joe? Uh, Ricky Tiedemann is 330. So yeah, about 40 picks higher. Yeah. So my point is 
and you'll uh, do Job here. Jackson Job is 468. Okay, so I mean, would you rather, you know, the prospect, um, you know, the prospect uh, potential here for whatever innings those are going to be, or lottery ticket on a guy that does have a longer track record of being successful than I? I'm not trying to make a big case for Alec Manoa because no thanks, you and I, Frank. I think I was out on him. That was my 2023. But when you get into that like post 300 range, and it's like, what are the type of lottery tickets that you want to take? I don't know, man. I don't, Manoa might make more sense than like jolted innings from a few prospects that have some questions in like it, like a guy like Tiedemann. Yeah, I, to I, put yeah. to put specifics on it. Now that I'm done with my starting pitcher rankings, I have Alec Manoa 93rd. I have Ricky Tiedemann 100 first. So I have Manoa eight spots ahead of Tiedemann, and Tiedemann is my highest ranked uh, pitcher prospect pitching prospect who has yet to appear in the majors at all. He's the highest ranked of of, uh, of that category of pitcher. So yeah, I, I, I agree with what you're saying there. Okay. White Sox GM, Chris Getz wouldn't rule out Yoan Moncada playing multiple positions in 2024. David Peterson underwent surgery to repair the labrum in his left hip and will miss six to seven months. And we have another manager. The angels hired Ron Washington, who has been with the Braves organization since 2017 uh, at different capacities. He was most recently their third base coach and previously managed the Texas Rangers from 2007 to 2014, much like we did on yesterday's podcast. I like to look into some manager tendencies during that time. And uh, the Rangers ranked fifth in steals during that run with uh, Ron Washington. So perhaps good news here for like a Zach Neto or Luis Renjifo. I, I, there's like no one else on the Angels roster. <laughs> that I think he's going to steal bases, but. Yeah, I don't think he's look. I mean, we're entering such a different era from stolen bases. I'm I'm not sure how much managerial tendencies even. At, plus, it was a completely different era of baseball when Washington was last managing. I just given his kind of nature, I I suspect he'll be somebody who encourages players to run. But yeah, guys who aren't uh don't really have the capacity for that i don't think are suddenly going i, I don't think we're suddenly going to see mike trout start to steal bases again because ron washington is the manager for the angels i mean the the main thing washington is known for is anybody who's seen or read moneyball knows is is uh coaching up players on the defensive side particularly infielders and so i wonder how much that played into the angels decision to bring him in as they're they're introducing new infielders like zach Neto. Um, like Nolan Shanwell um, to just kind of help do for them what happened for uh, Dansby Swanson and Austin Riley in the Braves organization where they went from being defensive question marks to true standouts. And I don't even, I don't even know how Neto ranks defensively. Maybe I'm not giving him enough credit. Maybe he already is a standout, but it couldn't hurt. It couldn't hurt to let Ron Washington go to work with them. I mean, otherwise it's weird, right? It, the angel, I don't think any of us view it. The angels as a contender with Otani presumably gone next year. So why are they bringing in a 72 year old? I think it's, I think it's mostly for player development reasons. Yeah, mm, I, maybe. I mean, I, but I also think there are some teams that are just poised to always have the presentation of like, Hey guys, we're winning We this is one of the best hires on the market. He can coach up our players. Like there are teams that are always trying to sell the market that they will be competitive when we all clearly know they will not be competitive. I love the idea of Ron Washington. If this organization had a bunch of players that were coming up and needed to be coached up and developed, but they don't, they are, they literally just brought up the guys. There's almost that, I mean, that system is it's atrocious and what he can help is so very limited. Maybe we're going to see a stark change, but I, I think they can present Ron Washington in a way to people where I think he would be suited better for like a younger team. You know, if like, you know, you got the Nettos, you're creating leaders, you're creating better <laughs> defenders on really good hit tools of young players. But there's just yeah. not a lot of those guys I in mean, that system. A, 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 a team like that, that is maybe like the Reds that's graduating a bunch of young in. Yeah, it's great. Or, exactly. or a team like with Dusty Baker taking over the Astros a few years ago, like that's clearly ready to contend already. Um, because you know, Ron Washington, 71 years old. I was, I was aging him prematurely. 71. Reds are the exact, like, that's but he doesn't have, example. he doesn't have, you know, a decade 
of potential managing the Angels. I wouldn't think. We've seen uh, managers in their 80s before, don't but I wouldn't think. Grave yet. Yeah. Um, who do, I mean, I guess there's a chance they move Mike Trout this offseason and maybe that kind of they recoup some uh, some prospects there and then kind of turn things around that way. But uh, yeah, as of now, it's uh, it's kind of a weird organization, roster construction, not great farm system uh, going on with the L.A. Angels. It looks but, like uh, it looks like Zach Neto is already a pretty stellar defender. So, again, it couldn't hurt. All right, let's get back into some other observations I made while out at First Pitch Arizona watching the Arizona Fall League. Uh, this one, not to the same level as other names that we've mentioned so far, but Friday night we saw Nationals pitcher Thad Ward, or uh, as he's known on some websites, Thaddeus Ward. He looked good. He had seven strikeouts, just one walk over five innings. Did give up three unearned runs, but that slider was flashing. I know that's very clearly his best pitch. Um, he made some made some great pitches. He made some hitters look foolish, including Yvonne Melendez, who's one of the top prospects out here. Mind you, he's 26 years old. I, I don't know that there will be much there, but the Nationals are a young team, and uh, maybe Thad Ward kind of carves out a role here. Walsh, any thoughts on what you saw there, and maybe if he can impact the Nationals in 2024? Yeah, I think it's a possibility. I don't want to be dismissive of it. I'm also not going to be... I can be very Pollyanna, like, oh, I saw this guy a lot. I love him, blah, blah, blah. I saw that pitch twice. Uh, I think it's fine. I think older, uh, advanced pitchers who can... One of the problems that Jackson Joe ran into is he got very predictable. That was something that I thought there were some warts with Tiedemann that he was able to mask a little bit more because he's just said, like he could throw a changeup at any time. And like changeups, especially de that developmental time, it were like really hard to hit. Same thing with like a slider. And Tiedemann could do that. My point is to come back to like when you get some of these more advanced pitchers who um, some have major league experience, some have been kind of taught, especially as you get to the higher levels and age just does it for you in baseball. You start to learn to um, pitch more than throw and you can kind of pitch from behind. Those older advanced pitchers sometimes can really take advantage here. So I'm not trying to be super dismissive of that ward but I'm not overly excited. I think the slider was good. I think it's the, it's the relief piece. Uh, maybe he's a fifth starter. Maybe he goes back and forth for a little bit between getting a, a, star, a spot start here and maybe doing long relief and then uh, six, seventh inning type of role. But um, maybe super deep leagues, you could take a look at it. There's definitely the potential for a roster spot for him. And they, they brought him out here to make a decision because this is going to be a decision time with that ward, but I'm not overly optimistic. Frankly, on that team, I would have rather, I like uh, Davis Daniel who was with the angels also probably somewhere between relief and a fifth role. Uh, he had one of the most bonkers curveball. This is 75 mile an hour that he just was able to use with, I think it was like a slider and a 91 mile an hour fastball that he just commands all the time. And then he just drops his curveball on you. I thought, he was a more advanced pitcher on that same team than Thad Ward. And he's a name that has popped out, you know, statistically in the Arizona Fall League. Um, Davis Daniel there with the Angels. And yeah, I think there's a chance he can earn an opportunity uh, with them here in 2024 as well. I'm not sure that the Arizona Fall League home run derby is a place that you go to kind of learn anything about prospects. Obviously, it was a ton of fun. We were talking beforehand and, you know, we kind of had the Zach Hampel thing going on. We're out there with baseball gloves and we're trying to catch home runs and stuff. You're, you're, bit, you're downplaying a little bit. It was like the most fun. It's the most fun I have. I'm getting older. I got kids. I try to have fun. Sometimes I can be a Debbie downer in some spots. Sometimes I get hyper-focused. Everyone else at first pitch is kind of hey, party time. I get very hyper-focused. I let loose and I had the most fun I've had in such a long time. And Frank is a total gaslighter, the best type of gaslighter that you love to have around you. And uh, I can't speak for you because you're, you have a much more exciting life than I have, Frank, but I had the best time. And I think that would look like the best time you had during first pitch. So running around the outfield of a home run derby is an a plus activity. We set the over under heading into the home run derby on one and a half. How many home run balls could we catch collectively as like first pitch Arizona? I think we had maybe 10, 15 guys and maybe 20 guys there. Uh, over under one and a half balls caught. We wound up with one. 
one. And it was Ruvain Guy uh, from the Beat the Shift podcast with Ariel Cohen. So shout out to him. That, a great moment. Like a little Almost. Kid, a little kid coming over, like trying to steal it from him. He's like, nah, I got it. He's man. like, this is important. <laughs> and But we almost had the one. I put my hat up there and it just like, here's the hat and the ball just went boom. And everybody was yelling at me because I didn't, I didn't put any vertical into it. And there's video of it as well. I'll have to share the video. Mm. It's the sad. two names that I wanted to mention here, just because obviously they've got some big pop. I looked into their minor league numbers and yeah, I mean, they, you know, uh, twins prospect Kalai Rosario. He's 21 years old. He hit 21 home runs in the minors this year. This guy was hitting tank jobs. I mean, I get it. It's whatever. It's a home run derby, but like he was hitting them further than anybody else out there. So just wanted to point that out. And Blue Jays prospect Damiano Palmajani, who uh, goes by the nickname of Cheese. Cheese. His teammates call him Cheese because it sounds like, I don't know, Parmesan, I guess. <laughs> um, Wait, which I'll an announcer it. did out here in the AFL announcer did announce him as Damiano Parmesan and the entire dugout screamed cheese after that was happened happened is the best thing and we screamed cheese every time yeah. he was up every time they announce his name in the home run derby all of us would just scream cheese you guys make t-shirts with like the top 10 inside jokes from uh we should. Arizona we I don't should. know if there's many more I think yeah. che cheese was a big one that was probably about it. I kind of wanted to run through as many as possible so that, you know, we can be inclusive and everyone else can <laughs> know <laughs> what was happening at first pitch Arizona. But no. uh, yeah, those were basically all of them. Like, I, I feel like you went to summer camp. And we kind of did. And we're trying to shame you to get you there next year. Because <laughs> as I said off air, one of the uh, one of the most asked questions, Frank and I collectively, because Frank and I spent a decent amount of the time together um, out there was where Scott. Scott was asked about so much. Literally, uh, some people were like, oh, Frank, love you, Welsh, take a picture and stuff. But then we had some people that saw us. They're like, hey, where's Scott White? <laughs> I was literally asked multiple times. So we just, we want to, we want to get you out there. A little peer pressure. A little yeah, no big deal. Just to come out. If you don't like to have fun, then don't worry about it. Uh, uh, fun's overrated. In, in Who case, needs it? In case Scott didn't believe me, I had to you know, pay the Welsh to, to say that here on the <laughs> podcast today. Um, is there anything to take away from these two Welsh, like long-term Kalai Rosario and, and Damiano Palmajani? Uh, I don't, I mean, Rosario, it's like plus, maybe plus power. Um, he didn't, you know, it wasn't like a big off, um, like a big uh, off season average type of guy, like 252 he hit in season. That's what I was trying to say. Uh, he did improve that off at 239. He actually, his teammate out here, Aaron Sabato, when Sabato was drafted a couple years ago, he was like crazy EVs. It was all about him, uh, 114, 115, but he's just consistently not hit for average. And Rosario, I, I don't think will ever be a batting average guy, but like what we saw, like I'm actually kind of down on Ivan Melendez after seeing him, even as a diamondback guy, I'm pretty down on him uh, off of the AFL. And Should I you keep saw him in the Scott white dynasty league um, over Matt Mervis. Mervis or should I keep, well, you just said it over finger. Mervis. Yeah, I would, I would have Melendez over Mervis, but I'm pretty okay. worried about what I saw with him. Okay. Rosario, I think has easy, easy power, but I think he's like a classic, 240 type of guy and when you just see power that's pitted up against guys like Kevin Alcantara and Ivan Melendez and he was prolifically I mean when he hit a homer it was 440 minimum every single time you saw plenty of other guys not get to that I think there was something with Rosario out there it's a much deeper league play it's a power only play I, I actually talked to him on Tuesday when I, I went over to Glendale and I was like, what's up home run champ. And he had a big smile. He was kind of happy about that. And uh, he's like, well, he's like on to the next one. He's like, I'm going to try to do it in this game here. Like there's a lot of guys that were ready to be gone from here. I won't say it, but there was one player that was like essentially actively rooting for them to not win. So they could go home and not play in the playoff <laughs> where Rosario was like very hyper competitive. Like he was very excited. He's like, Hey man, I appreciate the love. I'm ready to get back out here and hit some more bombs. Kind of a guy to root for very, very hyper focused and some of the best raw power as he won the home run derby out here. All right, let's take our final break. When we return, I've got some thoughts on the fall stars game and our Carson Williams interview. We'll do that right after this. On the next NFL Monday QB, historic rivals battle in Baltimore as the Ravens strive to stay in the hunt for the top of the AFC. Go under center on the only NFL show all about quarterbacks. 
Monday on CBS Sports Network. Welcome back in. Let's quickly run through the Fall Stars game, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's an all-star game for the best players out at first pitch um, at first pitch, uh, Arizona at uh, the Arizona fall league. That is what I'm trying to say. And uh, most notably, we talked about this yesterday. White Sox top prospect Colson Montgomery hit a 409 foot home run off of a lefty. So lefty on lefty. You love to see that. I saw him earlier in the week. I don't know how much you could take away from one game, but like he had two pretty awful looking strikeouts that I saw, but then he crushed that home run in the fall stars game. So like, all is forgiven, I think, right? I, I don't know. I mean, that is that is my least favorite kind of prospect analysis. Yeah, exactly. I went to, I went and saw this guy one time, and he struck out two times. Okay. I mean, like players strike out two times sometimes. But they were so, yeah, yeah, like, he struck out like 29 times when he was out here. But yeah, yeah, yeah to that point. I had someone confirm with me. Yeah, he's striking out a lot out here, and he's not walking. We're, we're, talk, we're talking about Colson Montgomery. Colson, I, I might have. The numbers have been terrific in the minors for yes. what it's yeah 20, 27 times in 20 games yeah, yeah it's been a lot i i brought this up, afl I, I brought this up to blessing and because uh, my my assumption of watching uh colson out here because there's something to be said about like brian ramos his teammate some people kind of may even like him a little bit more because he hits the ball really hard all the time is that like I think Colson was here to be like hyper aggressive. And I think sometimes guys are just out here to be hyper aggressive. Um, they won't tell us, but sometimes in the minors, we've even heard where it's like, Hey, don't swing at first pitches. Alec Thomas told me that one time there was like a level in the minors where like, they were not allowed to swing at, I think it was first pitch strikes and or the very first pitch. So I'm not saying that's what happened here, but I, I just, from what I've seen and watching him, before and in person here it just felt like there was a i'm going to be here to be hyper aggressive with maybe it's off-speed pitches or fastballs and he's eating a lot more i just i feel like it was a, a, an, an abnormal approach to what we usually see and that's something that can happen out here because everything else still looks amazing you know he's getting yeah. bigger the power the big numbers are there but it's some ugly strikeouts, which the only thing I can associate with it is a hyper aggression to want to swing out here, which some guys are doing. Some guys are out here as a couple guys. I mean, and, and it may have been a message passed down to him from the organization, like because you know, it's it exists for development, right? Arizona yeah. fault. That's why it's there. And uh, Colson Montgomery uh, got on base a ton, 456 OBP uh, between rookie ball high A, double A, mostly double A this year and um but you know the power was not the power production didn't quite live up to the scouting reports and hasn't yet for colson montgomery in the minors so maybe it was like okay try not being so passive and see how it goes yeah one of the things you don't want to do in the afl is walk because it's like the walks are abound so there is something to be said about being hyper aggressive to make sure you're not just getting a 450 OBP because you're going to have a lot of bad pitches. You're going to have guys that I love that can throw a hundred, but maybe not for command. And the walk numbers are always extremely higher here. After Colson Montgomery, we know that Kyle Manzardo is uh, one of the other big names out in the Arizona fall league. He crushed a home, <clears throat> excuse me, a home run in the fall stars game. He also struck out twice once on a high fastball, Again, it's an incredibly small sample size, but well, so I do know that you had the opportunity to talk to Manzardo and he acknowledged that he preferred pitches lower in the zone. So it just, it was interesting to me to see that like, okay, maybe he does struggle with high fastballs. And I saw that up close and personal. He struck out on a high fastball. Do you think that is something that pitchers, I mean, they should look to exploit in the majors, but is it something that you're worried about with Manzardo? No. So I asked him this exact question, not just like about, because what he said, he actually told us um, in the home run derby, he wanted low in the zone because to what you're saying, he liked to hit. But I also asked him that I noticed that he was getting pitched high and inside a lot. And he had an answer for it, which, which was pretty interesting. He said the level that he was playing at there was pretty, uh, I think it had to do with the ABS. I got to go back and listen to my own interview, but it had to do with the ABS system, that there was no ABS and that top of the zone was just kind of taken away from them. And he said he actively didn't worry about the top of the zone based on um, 
where he was hitting. So this is something a little bit new and he has been actively attacked and he recognizes it and he knows he's here adjusting because he likes the bottom of the zone and he spent most of the minor league not worried about the top of the zone and where he was. And I thought that was really interesting that he was cognizant of that and he understood that. And I thought it was the maturity of the hitter that he is. And that's why I'm still banking on him. You know, he got his average back up, but it went back down. He's got crazy good power. Um, I love his ability to hit low, but we have seen major leaguers and I've said it at nauseum, but like, you know, the Cardinals with Nolan Gorman, they're like, Hey, you need to go to driveline and you need to figure out how to hit high fastballs. I think that's something that he's aware of right now. Like he is aware of this upper zone is part of his work and he can cheat a little bit on lower stuff. I think that's a good place to be in. And I think uh, defensively he's fine and um, just he was a great interview and very smart guy. And, you know, he had a, he, he there wasn't a lot of confusion. Sometimes you get guys that are just kind of like, eh, we got lucky. You know, Triantos gave us, I thought, incredible answers and was very insightful as was Manzardo. And some guys don't, sometimes they don't talk about the process and he did. And the understanding of the process gives me a lot of hope. All right. Lastly, I wanted to mention from the Fall Stars game, Emiliano Teodo. We got the full experience. And this guy was the talk of the town, basically, out at first pitch, Arizona. People were talking about how live his arm was. He throws over 100 miles per hour. He's got this wipeout slider. James Triantos revealed to us that Teodo is now throwing a sinker, which is something he wasn't doing a couple of years ago. Again, you could check that interview out uh, from the previous podcast that the Welsh and I did with uh, James Triantos. The full experience, he threw one inning, gave up zero hits, two walks, two hit by pitch, two wild pitches, zero strikeouts, but again, consistently hitting over 100 miles per hour. He has dominated out there. 11 shutout innings overall, uh, 19 strikeouts to three walks. Scott, you and I were kind of talking yesterday, and you're like, well, who is this guy, Teodo? Um yeah, I, think I hadn't heard of him. Like the Rangers closer of the future, assuming that they don't sign anybody because like all the prediction pieces that I'm seeing right now are like, yeah, Josh Hader is going to the Rangers. Like everyone's just assuming that. So we don't know yet, but mm -hmm. if Josh Hader doesn't go there, then maybe Teo well, has a future as a closer. And I mean, at one point, Emmanuel Class A looked like the Rangers closer of, closer of the future, and then he became the Guardians closer True. of the present. So uh, who knows how things de can develop, but... This is how relief pitcher development happens. The reason I hadn't heard of Emiliano Teodo is, let me say that name again since it's new to most of our listeners, Emiliano Teodo, T-E-O-D-O. -O. The reason I hadn't heard of him is because he was a not very good starting pitcher prospect prior to entering the Arizona Fall League, where, to give you the numbers, he struck out 19 and in 11 innings, walked only three. I mean, maybe you saw two of them, but he walked only three in those 11 innings and had just the one hit by pitch. So like he was dominant in what's clearly a hitter's league. Uh, I mentioned it before. Arizona Fall League, it's all in Arizona. It's a lot of hitter friendly uh venues, which is why you see some of these not so powerful hitters put up pretty good power numbers sometimes. Uh but Teodo pitched great. He's 22, he'll be 23 before opening day. Hasn't pitched even at Double A yet. So it's you know, he's not in the Rangers or any other organization's immediate plans, but, um, you know, it's, I, I don't even bother to rank relief. I do position by position prospect rankings in the off season. I don't even bother to do a separate relief pitcher thing because those guys develop later, usually converting from starting pitcher, either in the upper stages of the minors, or even once they get to the majors, it happens. I mean, Josh Hader was a starting pitcher prospect until he reached the majors and he became a closer. Uh, so it's, you there's not a lot of utility or a lot of um uh for for relief pitcher prospects there's not a lot of utility for relief pitcher prospects in fantasy but i do think based on the way things went for emiliano teodo in the arizona fall league he's a name to keep in mind 100 let's wrap up here with our interview of carson williams the Rays shortstop prospect, first round pick from back in 2021. He's just 20 years old, already got some games in a double A and triple A. He's got big power and speed, but issues making contact. We're talking about a 30% strikeout rate in the minors. True story. We were first introduced to Carson Williams and uh, we're like, thank you for your time, whatever. We'll make this quick. And he goes, yeah, let's make this quick. 
I got to go play Fortnite. It's <laughs> well, a real thing that happened. Yeah, and it's good because I, I don't know if it's cut out of this or not, but like I, I make a mention of it at the end because like yeah. he was walking. He had two bats in his hand, a bag, and he was walking out, and the AFL guy grabbed him, and you could see it. It's so funny because you feel like you just feel like these guys in the corner. We're sitting over there on the field, and they're pointing, and Carson looks at us, and he's like, all right, these guys are going to be all right. And he walked up, and I was just trying to – set the mood because we felt bad. And I was just like, Hey man, sorry, we're grabbing you right as you're trying to get out of there. And then he's like, yep, got to go play Fortnite." And I think he even says it in here, like 30 minutes from now, I'll be playing Fortnite." And uh, I thought it was interesting too, because it's like, my kid is playing Fortnite, and I forget how old I am sometimes. And you hear that and you're just like, Oh, listen, this silly kid. And you're just like, well, he's actually closer to my kid's age and he's closer to mine. Yet he's a professional athlete. You want to give them the credit for it. But yeah, that we were, it usually, I work very hard to kind of um, uh, I'm forgetting the word, but like bring down the walls a little bit for prospects and just kind of like, you know, make them feel comfortable. And I, I felt like he almost got us a little bit and he, it almost threw me <laughs> through both of us off. We're like, Oh, Fortnite, because we, it wasn't even just like a half joke. It was like, yeah, no, no, the new season's out. I haven't even played it yet. It was like a real thing. And we're like, all right, man. So I'm still dying to know how he, does so none of us are going to know yet but uh that was the uh, setup to the interview yeah we should got like his gamer tag or something or i i don't even i don't know what the kids call them anymore uh anywho let's wrap up uh this is race top prospect carson williams he's talking about what he's working on in the afl a little insider scouting report as well on his former teammate junior camonero buddy it's welsh it's frank and we're here with tampa bay rays Carson Williams, one of the big studs out here in the AFL. Actually, one of the craziest things I was thinking about was when you were here, when you got announced to be here, you're actually like the top prospect, according to Baseball America. What well, kind of a weird feeling is that when you are <laughs> anointed as the top guy? I mean, you had Vlad Jr., Ronald Acuna, big years. Mm -hmm. You're the guy that got brought out there. There's a lot of like kind of extra pressure, but I feel yeah, like you can handle it. It's an honor. It's an honor for everything. Everything uh, coming my way, I just kind of, every day is a day to get better. You know? Yeah. Uh, the experience in the Arizona Fall League, playing with a lot of great players, mm -hmm. what have you pulled out of that? Because you've had a really interesting year, too. Lower levels, we had some higher strikeout rates. You dropped them when you yep. caught up. So, like, you've shown so much maturity and a lot of advancement and you're getting to put that on display here yep. have you taken the regular season into the Arizona Fall League uh, absolutely um, this just I mean I think our manager Mo says it best this is all practice every single day is practice in the minor leagues and including the AFL right now there's ups and downs the AFL it's been it's been kicking my butt a little bit you know it's just it's how it works but then you have good games you have bad games and it's all just practice and to make it up to the big leagues well I was gonna ask you and Frank's got some here too I was gonna ask like how unimportant are the stats? I talked to Victor Scott and Reggie Crawford a little bit ago, and you don't want to be dismissive of like anything that you do, mm -hmm. but how how unconcerned are you about what you're actually putting up on the stat sheet here versus the proper things that you're accomplishing? No, no, no. I'm not. I'm not really worried about that stuff right now. It's uh, it's just about getting at bats. I'm uh, I'm in a unique position where I'm young and I'm going to be in the higher levels next year, so as many at-bats as I can get against this premium pitching is is awesome for me. Yeah, and there really yes. has been. Speaking of which, the premium pitching, anyone that stands out, like who's the toughest pitcher you've faced out here? I actually haven't faced Tiedman, but everyone in our locker room says he's, <laughs> he's, the, he's the guy. He's the guy. Him and Job. Him and Job, too. I was talking mm -hmm. with Reggie Crawford. Job was working on a new cutter out here. That's kind of a hard experience. You know, Reggie Crawford actually had this to say. He said, you get these scouting reports mm -hmm. on some of these guys, but then you might have guys out here that are working on completely oh, new absolutely. stuff. And how do you, how do you even, like, so work through? There's, there's there's hitters that uh, that go that make their plan based on off that stuff and they sit on pitches and stuff and that makes it a lot harder out here for some guys. And then also there's guys that kind of go up there hit do their thing. It's 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 different for everybody. Yeah, yeah. So we're talking about pitchers that are working on new things. Anything in particular that you're focused on working on while you're out here? Yeah. Just uh, staying through the ball right now. Uh, started started this whole thing off and kind of have been pulling off the ball a lot here so just really trying to stay through the ball and make good swing decisions is that about the strikeouts is that about minimizing that because it gets overplayed strikeouts get overplayed yeah, quite yeah, a bit yeah. but um the strikeouts for me at this point it's it, they of course they matter and you want to keep them down as much as you can but that's not what I'm interested in right now I'm, yeah. I'm trying to find ways to hit the ball hard put it in play and that'll take care of itself so we, we've had this interesting thing we've been doing with my friend uh, Enos Harris at The Athletic we've been going through. There's a lot of voices that are out there. You've got your own coaches with the Rays. Mm -hmm. You've got AFL coaches. Yep. 
parents, friends, college, teammate, high school, you got all these people. How do you quiet the voices or maybe find a focus point on what you need to do? Because there are so many people that are telling you what you need to do. Yeah, there's a keep your circle small for anybody out there who goes through all this stuff. Keep your circle small and respect everybody's opinion. It yeah. doesn't mean you have to go by it, but uh, just respect them, listen, and do your own thing. But, like, in that same respect, um, do you have to trust in what you've learned through this process to get you to those next steps? That's what's Absolutely. really important. Yeah, yeah. you need to it's, – it's all about trusting the process. I mean, for me, the the process is – it's it's hard, it's long, and I'm just going to keep going at it. Obviously, you're getting closer to the majors. How cool is it to see someone that you played with, right, like in a junior Caminero, make mm-hmm. it to the majors at this point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my guy. That is my guy. He, uh, I go to him for offense, and he comes to me for defense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I love that kid to death. He deserves it all. He's probably one of the best players I've ever seen in my life. Really? Oh, yeah. my gosh. Ha- go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, have you, like, have you had this moment where you're like, oh, my God, he's there. Mm-hmm. You could be there, like, Really, really. So you're a young player. You you're very smart. You acknowledge like where yeah. you're at in that. But to see him progress, like you two could be playing with each other absolutely. in like six months. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, that's the goal. I mean, I I think uh, next year we're gonna work on the things I need to work on with uh, with the swing. I'm gonna keep my defense solid, and we're gonna see where I can get up to. On Caminero, I wanted to ask. What's the advanced scouting report? What's what's your idea like playing with Caminero? What can you tell us about him? About him? Uh, brings a lot of energy. Kid's electric. He's the best bat I've ever seen in my entire life. And for any pitchers going against him, don't miss. <laughs> don't miss because it's going to go really far. Nice. Last two things. Um, as far as this season just went, who's the toughest pitcher that comes to mind? First pitcher that comes to mind where you're just like, oh, oh my gosh. God. There's, there's too many. There's yeah. too many. Well, because you also went triple A, double A. Yeah, you had a yeah, lot of interesting absolutely. experience. Uh, it could be here, too. Yeah. Um, I, c- I couldn't tell you. I'm not great with names. I want to say my guy Logan Workman. I was telling him, by the way. Uh, well, he's just, that's my team. I know, but he's you got to place him here. He's oh, 96 nasty. just all the time. Yeah, I think like people absolutely. need to understand. His changeup is his best pitch. Yeah. And it's not fun. No, it's and he's got fun. 96 command all the time. He's a crazy, crazy talent. Very, very good. Last one is just 2024 goals. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is, I mean, obviously there's stay healthy, there's improve on some of the simple logistics, but are there any like hardcore statistical goals or anything that you really want to accomplish? No, just want to become a better, better hitter, better defender, better person better athlete all together season one uh chapter five Fortnite. oh gosh <laughs> what do we do what's the gun the gun oh gosh There's... what's the loadout what's the loadout that's what's important it's just simple here. ar and a, and a pump and it's that's all you need pump, okay <laughs> pump ar that's the loadout okay yeah, well it's og I'll be in Fortnite. retail in 30 minutes <laughs> <laughs> og Fortnite is back and uh carson williams all right, we appreciate sweet. you all right thanks, thanks, have a good you, one, guys. Thank thanks you. so much for your yeah, time no man problem. Again, thanks again to uh, Carson Williams of the Tampa Bay Rays for uh, giving us his time and to uh, the AFL for hooking us up there. And obviously, there, there's some interesting stuff that he talked about. He acknowledged that the AFL was, quote, kicking his butt. And as of now, he's batting 246. He's got 30 strikeouts, over 80 plate appearances. That is a 38% strikeout rate. Not exactly what you want to see from uh, a kid who has struck out as much as he has in the minors. Uh, but you know, Welsh, I wonder, because like he said he was like just focusing on hitting the ball hard. So like maybe strikeouts, he just, like he said, he just doesn't really care about that right now in the AFL. I mean, he doesn't. Well. He, <laughs> I mean, he doesn't. Yeah, I think it's we not should. just the AFL where he has strikeout problems. <laughs> well, and that's what I, I mean. I, I feel bad because now I've seen Carson Williams and I kind of like him and I don't want to speak ill of him. But uh, man, the strikeouts up and down, like. He ranks highly among prospects. I know defense is a big part of it. He's a standout defender at shortstop, which is always going to carry a lot of weight in prospect circles. And, you know, he has power. But these strikeout rates, um, even in the lower minors, are high. I can't, I can't pull up the exact number right now because my computer's grinding. But it was like, a 30, it was like 31% yeah. at, 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 yeah, at, at that's high A, and then he had like six mm. games at double A where it was like around 20%. And I am I am lower on Carson Williams than the typical prospect guy. I as say. am I. I th- yeah. That's why I always like note, like I get kind of chirped about it and stuff like that. You know, he did say something interesting, and I'm forgetting the la- last thing I want to do is listen to myself or see myself in any of that. <laughs> but he said something about... Um, where he was trying to get inside on balls and like he definitely has been slower in, in reaction out here. And ultimately the thing you're looking for is like 
the improvement. You know, you're looking for the guy to make the adjustments over time. I think it's very positive that he's unaffected, um, that he recognizes maybe where some of those swing and miss issues are coming from, where I think he was saying he was just like, things are getting inside on him, but it's like high fastballs have been a problem. It's tough because he's very likable. He's very engaging, stares you in the eye with to both of us. I mean, he They're was actual very- people. They can't be These people for me. They <laughs> These need to be slaps on a page so I can remain objective. I did an interview with a prospect one time who's in the majors right now who did not look at me for nine straight minutes. We did an interview. He, he was like so engaging <laughs> to the prep and back and forth, back and forth. And the minute the interview started, he just like looked away. But like Carson Williams is like, he's very engaged, smiling. He, he's a very smart guy. And those are the type of people you kind of bet on it. Plus you should acknowledge he's younger. But I do think there's a gap between like, hey, he's the 20th best prospect in baseball to where the development is and where it could kind of go. Um, but yeah, he's kind of easy to root for. He's a nice guy. Yeah. And I'm dying to know how he where how he's doing in Fortnite. How many crown <laughs> wins he has. Uh last point, what he said on Junior Caminero, quote, best bat I've ever seen in my life for any pitchers going against him. Don't Miss Camonero, a consensus top five fantasy prospect. He got seven games in with the uh, with the Rays last season. Crushed the minors, hit 324, 31 home runs, a 975 OPS as a 20 year old for Junior Camonero. And across 18 drafts so far, his ADP is 195. Does that sound like uh, an appropriate time to buy Camonero, Scott? Do you know where that is among third basemen? Because I haven't done my combined rankings yet, so I can I can I can gauge if I'm in line with that or not. More I if I know where like, he ranks at his position. I bet that's like 15, 16. That makes him uh, nineteen. So it's I'm twelfth. It's just behind uh, Jake Berger and Isak Paredes in ADP. Okay, and it was it, it sounds like it's quite a bit different from that mock draft we looked at uh, that you did the other day, Frank. It sounds like uh, that was that was a real draft, Scott. I'm sorry, that real draft you did. Uh, I have Common Arrow 12th, and I imagine I imagine he's going to move up in ADP as there gets to be more ADP. All right, well, jam-packed episode. We're going to wrap there for Scotty and the Welsh. I am Frank. Thanks, as always, for tuning in to Fantasy Baseball today. Please make sure to follow and leave a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify, and we will be back again next week. Bye-bye.